fourth edition of Redefining Community in the Cultural Context International Conference. The main goal of this conference is an exchange of experience between professors, researchers and practitioners in the field of community dynamics. We try to put into practice the new ideas that will result from the cross fertilization of teaching activities and scientific research. Our end goal is to improve the quality of education and consequently personal and intellectual development. Last but not least, we are eager to disseminate the results of our multicultural dialogue within the academic community and beyond. The Defining Community Intercultural Context is a scientific event held at Henry Conte Fuchs Academy in Warsaw. This university that celebrates in 2015 20 years of existence as a singular institution in Romania that provides with education and training within the field of Air Force is the motivator of the Romanian Aviation School that was the fourth institution of aviation in the world. The Defining Community Intercultural Context is not only a scientific event of Henry Conte Fuchs Academy but an event of the entire city and county. This is the reason for having the opening session and the plenary presentation within the most famous college in Rashov, Amisha Kuna National College, and the official closing within the most famous university in the city, Transylvania University. Please allow me to invite our rector, General Professor Vasilov Luczynski, to address you the speech of the official opening of International Conference Verifying Community in the Russian Context.
keynote speakers, all of them are the well evaluated and rated by members of the scientific committee, first ranked scholars from Brazil, Israel, Italy, Malta, Poland, Portugal, Spain, United States, and Romania. Furthermore, papers of professors, research, and uh, practitioners from Albania, Austria, Czech Republic, South Korea, France, Greece, India, Israel, Italy, Moldavia, Portugal, Slovenia, USA, and Romania were accepted. This conference is part of a series of scientific events organized by our institution for the year of 2015. In April, Air Force Academy hosted the Students International Conference between the 21st and the 23rd of May. We had the current scientific event followed by AFASES 2015, Education and Research in the Air Force next week. Furthermore, the Academy will be involved in other scientific manifestations, symposia, workshops and seminars, both as an co-organizer or as a partner. We believe that the scientific life of our institution is very active, intrinsically motivated and firmly anchored into the realities of the contemporary society. We are pleased and honored about the presence of the distinguished professor Lucia Jock, Eva Maria Remerger, and Rena Buza, who accepted to the invitation to defend their papers within the plenary session of this year's conference awards. We enjoy the contribution of personalities who identify themselves with the conference. The distinguished professor Mario, Maria de Sao Jose Cordereal from the Universidad Nova of Lisbon, Portugal, who was the soul of this scientific event and has been with us during each of the editions. We also appreciate the constant presence, support and promotion of other LCIC community members, Professor Alberto Fornasari, Maricelda Tesarolo, Asher Shafir, Nicoleta Corbu, Raul Calegonia, Ella Chiberto, and our program. I am proud and delighted, on the other hand, that the entire community of Russia supports such an important and relevant scientific event. We are thus hosted here by the most prestigious national college that gave Romania 49 academicians. On the last day of the conference, we will be featured and hosted by the Transylvania Transylvania University, the prestigious higher education institution in the city. Personalities of the local public environment, administration, representatives, scholars, scientific personalities, journalists, students, and pupils are here with us. This is indeed a suitable framework to open a conference that deserves full attention to the convergence towards beautiful and generous ideas to be launched during this scientific event. I welcome this wonderful audience from the Festivity Hall of the Amnesia National College and I thank our host for their professional involvement, also the for the, this beautiful building. I had the honor to declare open the fourth edition of this international conference. I'm grateful to your coming to Russia, to the Air Force Academy, as well as to your contribution to the scientific dialogue. Good luck to all the conference participants. Thank you.
aici, alături de dumneavoastră, la această conferință internațională, ediția a patra, cu bătrânci scris în această invitație pe care mi-ați adresat-o. Am convingerea că această conferință va deschide calea unei colaborări între Inspectoratul Școlar al Gașon și Mediul Universitar.
honor for me to invite Professor Paolo Coma, Professor at Kastrana University in Warsaw, the President of Warsaw County Council, to address you the welcome speech. Thank you, with your permission, I prefer to remain seated. First, I'm ready to reduce the social distance, the formal distance. Honorary guests and participants, dear colleagues, on behalf of Russian County Council, it is my great pleasure we welcome you to Brasov for the fourth edition of the International Conference Redefining Community in Intercultural Context. Please allow me to thank all the institutions involved in the organization of the conference, the organizing committee, the scientific committee, the keynote speakers, and other participants. Thank you. As one of the main authorities of local public administration, Brasov County Council, strongly encourages the initiative of Henri Quanta Air Force Academy together with Henri Quanta Association for Research and Education and National College and Puna to facilitate an exchange of experience between teachers, researchers and practitioners in the field of community dynamics and to aim at improving the quality of education as well as personal and intellectual development. Since many centuries ago, Brussels County has been a multicultural space where multicultural tradition coexists among Romanians and minorities. According to statistical evidence in Russia, most representative minorities are Germans, Hungarians, Jews, Greeks, Italians, Roma, and Russians. These ethnic communities have manifested in the form of well-defined cultural communities and currently have a significant impact on the spirituality of Brussels County. Means of expression refer to language, religion, and habits that are available, available to the public through social, cultural, and religious events organized by representatives of each community. Russia County Council is strongly preoccupied to preserve the well defined identities of each cultural, cultural community while providing at the same time opportunities for them to develop and interact. We all life live nowadays in a multicultural environment facing the challenge of intercultural communication. Thus, we find that focusing on contemporary transformation of linguistics is essential in our multicultural world. Therefore, I wish you all a pleasant stay in Russia and a successful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The plenary, the plenary session will begin in a few minutes. Before starting, I invite you to congratulate the team that made possible our meeting today, Professors Cosmina Doma, Daniela Lodi, and Cosmini Baju, on behalf of the organizing committee and, of course, the scientific committee of the conference. Professor Vasilo Muczynski, Henry Conley for Saturday in Russia, Romania. George Lich Antonio, University of Sorocaba, Kiete, Brazil. Sandro Caruana, Faculty of Education, University of Malta. Anka Kodrian, Aura Codriano, the Regional Department of Defense Resources Management, Russia, Romania. Nicoleta Corbu, National University of Political Sciences and Public Administration, Bucharest, Romania. Maria de São José Cotrian, Faculty of Sciences Sociales and Humanas, University of Nova Lisbon, Portugal. Ela Chupert, National Intelligence Academy, Bucharest, Romania, Alberto Conazadi, Aldomo University of Bari, Italy, Ana Maria Camunti Banios, Pontifica Universitatea Catolica do Rio Grande do Sul, uh, Porto Alegre, Brazil, Indira Chumhare, Institute of Linguistics, College of Liberal Arts, University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, United States, Vasile Makoviciu, Department of Philosophy and Social Humanities, Academy of uh, Economic Studies, Bucharest, Romania, Eugene Nistor, Petrumaya University of Tirumuresh, Romania, Angel Gabriel Alonso, Faculta de Educacio, Traducio de Ciencias Humanas, Universidad de Vic, Barcelona, Spain, Piotr Romanovski, Institute of Specialized and Intercultural Communication, Faculty of Applied Linguistics, Warsaw University, Poland, 
Does Václav Tulio Akutio Fredges, Transylvania University of Russia, Romania, Stefania Stagnoni, University of Foreigners of Perugia, Italy, Asher Shafik, Aviv University, Israel, Marizelda Casagoro, Department of Philosophy, Sociology, Pedagogy and Applied Psychology, University of Padua, Italy, and Dorica Zafiu, Department of Linguistics, Faculty of Letters, University of Bucharest, Romania. Please allow me to introduce the first keynote speaker within this conference, Associate Professor Elena Ruzsa, Faculty of Letters at Transylvania University, Kashov. Elena Ruzsa got his Bachelor degree in English and German from Babesh Boya University in Ruzsa Boka and her PhD in Linguistics from Eyot Bosch Logan University in Budapest. She is currently a member of the teaching staff of the Faculty of Letters at Transylvania University of Warsaw, where she teaches courses of English languages such as English phonetics and phonology, lexicology, semantics and new Englishes, as well as a course of, uh, in intercultural difference and in non-verbal communication. Her main research interests are in the first language acquisition, the acquisition of phonology, vocabulary and grammar of Romanian as a first language, the acquisition of narrative skills and intercultural communication. Dr. Puja has published one monograph relating events in narrative, a case study of Romanian at Zagreb in Germany, a book which is based on her PhD thesis. She was authored a number of courses, of course books uh, for her students, and co-edited two volumes with Stanka Mladas, Capture, Use and Meaning, Linguistic Studies, at Kuzna Boka and Rashov. Elena Kuzna's articles related to, the, to her main research interests have appeared mainly in national but prestigious publication and also in volumes published by prestigious publishing houses such as Cambridge or Uppsala University Publishing House. Professor Elena Bujan. Two reasons. 
One is that moving pictures produce a much stronger impact on the viewers. And secondly, um, they represent the primary source of information for most voters, especially for the ones who, like me, do not know much about politics and who are influenced by the way in which people react under um, stressful conditions. Uh, what I wanted to see is the extent to which um, the Romanians' decision to vote for one candidate or the other was influenced by their number of behavior, uh, mainly in the two televised debates, but also along the presidential election campaign. And uh, my um, intention was stirred by, uh, sorry, by Kaufman's idea that normal arrangement of a candidate style has uh, an important role as the nonverbal elements of people's behavior cannot be controlled very easily, especially uh, when they are under stress. So, uh, my presentation has got the following structure. I will talk first a little bit about the presidential elections. Uh, then, since the focus is on the nonverbal behavior, I um, will um, briefly list the nonverbal dimensions, also known as codes. Then we will move to the research methodology and the research questions. Quickly to the analysis and then some conclusions will be drawn at the end of the presentation. Um, election campaigns um, are a tough uh, battlefield. Um, they represent a period, a pretty long period in which uh, there are all kinds of uh, activities. Uh, in which the uh, candidates try to uh, show their ideas in order to uh, convince the voters to vote for them. Uh, they consist of a series of actions that are aimed at making certain groups of voters support these ideas, to, to support these ideas. And uh, as such, they are very scholarly organized. And all these activities are somehow supervised by uh, the Central Electoral Bureau but they are stipulated, so the actions are uh, stipulated in uh, law 370 that was passed in 2004 and which was a little bit uh, updated uh, in 2014. Um, unlike uh, in some other democratic countries where uh, voters do have a number of options to cast their votes, like the electronic vote or the mail-in vote. Uh, the poor Romanians have only one possibility, namely to cast their vote in person at one of the um, voting polls. Uh, during this uh, period, the candidates can promote themselves by a number of possibilities, either through brief meetings, um, short appearances in various places, banners, flyers, um, using endorsement of celebrating people as you will see in a second, and um, more importantly, through the televised debates. Uh, here you have some pictures in which uh, you see Victor Ponta making use of um, our famous tennis player, Simona Halep. Actually, this was a trick. So he praised Simona Halep, uh, saying, Bravo, Simona, we are all proud of you. But actually, the page, uh, if you click the like, yeah, the like will go to uh, Victor Ponta's Facebook and not just one of uh, Here you have Victor Ponta surrounded by soldiers. To tell you the truth, I do not know whether the photo was taken in Afghanistan or whether it's fake. Yeah, and most probably he was photographed here in the country. No offense meant. Uh, here he is he's surrounded by priests to show that he's a very um, good uh, Christian. Uh, here he makes use of a famous ballad singer, a Romanian ballad singer by the name of Tudor Gheorghe. Here he shows that he cares about the children, whereas here you have uh, one of the banners that he made use of in the election campaign. Uh, he's not the only one to have done this. Klaus Johannes uh, also made use of all the means available. Uh, you see the banners for both of them, uh, and here you see one means that they made recourse to in order to influence the voters, namely offering them small bonuses. Um, why did I focus on the nonverbal behavior? Because I consider that um, it is very essential to take a look at how people react under stress. 
Because uh, in most of the cases, their behavior is not controlled. It is unconscious. And then uh, you have a chance of seeing how these people behave naturally, what their real faces are. Um, we do communicate by a number of means, as you have learned in school. Um, the most important or the most frequent channel of communication is the verbal one. But it seems that the nonverbal channel is more um, trustworthy. So you should rely more on the nonverbal um, behavior than on the speech itself, what the people say. Uh, sometimes um, the verbal behavior is um, complemented by the nonverbal one. Uh, some other times the nonverbal behavior contradicts the speech. And then which of them will you believe? The verbal message or the nonverbal one. Yeah? Specialists advise us to believe the nonverbal behavior or the nonverbal message. What do we mean by nonverbal communication? Maybe the kids at the back do not have any idea about it, or maybe they are already specialists. Um, anthropologists and linguists have come up with lots of definitions. The first was given by uh, the famous anthropologist Edward Sapir, who says that nonverbal communication is an elaborate and secret code that is written nowhere, but that is understood by everybody. Yeah? So you do not uh, need to learn much about nonverbal behavior, but if you have a keen eye or a good eye, you can uh, decode the nonverbal messages transmitted by the written interpreters. Uh, another definition, uh, I will skip the second one, was provided by Lustig and Koester, uh, who say that the normal communication is a multi channel process that is usually performed spontaneously and it involves a subtle set of non linguistic behaviors that are often enacted outside a person's conscious awareness. Now, the reason why I underline this uh, syntax set of non linguistic behaviors is that these are treated as uh, some kind of sets of um, symbols that are used according to certain rules. So just like speech, nonverbal behavior also makes use of symbols and rules of combining them in order to deliver the message. Um, the codes of the dimensions of nonverbal communication are listed here. Kinesics, which refers to the body posture. So you see that I have adopted a very defensive posture now. I cover my tummy, my heart, because I'm pretty nervous. Um, when we speak, we make use of our hands in order to emphasize what we say. We make use of various um, facial expressions when we are happy, when we are sad. We focus our eyes on our interlocutors, or we don't, uh, depending on the message that we want to send or depending on the feelings that we have towards them. Um, appearance and adornment is another quote. Um, here we refer to um, the way we dress, the way we look, uh, the way nature has left us on this earth, uh, the way we use jewels, the way we use our clothes, and so on and so forth. Um, then another dimension uh, is volcanics, also known as final language. And here we refer to how we change the speed of our speech, uh, what pauses and when we make pauses, um, how we make use of the intonation, uh, and here we also include the use of silence. Um, spatial communication refers to the way in which we use space, and you can see that this is also reflected in uh, the behavior of our two candidates, so I will not insist too much on this. Uh, tactile communication, this refers to uh, the way in which people uh, tend to hug, shake hands, embrace, kiss each other, slap each other's back, and so on and so forth. And finally, we have the use of time, also known as promenades. So, don't expect that I will go through all these, yeah? So, I will focus only on kinesics uh, in my presentation, and uh, that will be all. Uh, I think I will skip this part and move to the research methodology. So in order to identify how these two guys uh, behaved uh, not verbally, I needed a large uh, corpus, so I um, took into account uh, visuals, both static and moving. So I collected some photos that were um, published by the internet and also uh, watched the two televised debates very thoroughly. Uh, in order to uh, focus on certain nonverbal elements. Um, and these 
movements were the phallic symbolism, body movements, kinesics, uh, the facial expressions, and the gaze uh, related to kinesics. And uh, the method that I was uh, that I used was um, uh, the print screen. Yeah, uh, I became familiar with this technique. Some students of mine told me how to use it. Uh, and I also took advantage of the fact that uh, the debates were presented by uh, the television channels in this format, in this split screen format, uh, which gives the viewers the opportunity to compare how the two people behave simultaneously. Yeah? Uh, now, starting from the assumption that uh, the candidate's normal behavior may have an impact on how viewers are going to vote, uh, I came up with two research questions. The first one is how does the media's visual presentation of a candidate reveal um, about Ponta and Johannes, oh, sorry, what does the media reveal about Ponta and Johannes in the last presidential campaign? Whether they are good, reliable persons or whether they are wicked persons? And secondly, which of the nonverbal um, codes investigated had uh, a say in the outcome of the elections. And now we'll move to uh, the debates. Uh, now the televised debates with, uh, are quite a recent phenomenon in the political arena in Romania. Uh, the first one took place in uh, 2000, and, uh, sorry, in 1992. The two debaters being Lolo and uh, Emil Constantinescu. The last one, uh, last year, where we had uh, Victor Ponta, a member of the Social Democratic Party, and Klaus Johannes, a member of the Christian Liberal uh, Alliance, sorry. And uh, the debates uh, have both advantages and disadvantages. I will mention only the advantages, namely that they heightens the citizens' awareness uh, as far as the elections are concerned, and they also stir their interest in going to vote, to cast their vote. Uh, there are means of enabling the people to get information about the candidates, and as such, they are a useful supplement to the news coverage. Um, now, here we have um, pictures from both debates. Uh, the first one uh, on the 11th of November, the second uh, followed immediately afterwards on the 12th of November. Um, one, the problem that uh, appeared was the fact that um, there were disagreements and lots of delays concerning the, the debates. Uh, they did not agree on which channel to broadcast the debate and in the end uh, it was decided that the first should take place um, at Realita uh, TV, whereas the second one was broadcast by uh, Romania TV or Berlin TV. Uh, since the tradition of the debates is pretty new in Romania, uh, I have to say that the first debate was not very well prepared, especially by the moderator. And uh, consequently, uh, he started talking quite a lot at the very beginning, and only uh, after 20 minutes, yeah, uh, what happened was that Johannes was wondering what the pattern of the debate is. Okay, so the first code I'm going to approach is tactics or touching behavior. This refers to shaking hands, to kissing hands, to embracing, hugging, whatever. Much to my disappointment, in none of the photos I had access to, uh, have I seen the two candidates shaking hands, which shows that they were true enemies. Um, on the second day, in the second debate, uh, the moderator, Madalina Pushkalo, waited for both candidates outside the television plateau. And uh, Klaus Johannes was uh, photographed kissing um, the moderator's hand, um, something that I think melted the hearts of the female voters. Yeah? Why? Because uh, a hand kiss is something that uh, reflects sincerity and appreciation, especially in the case of women. Uh, it's a gesture that is not very much used any longer. It's falling out of fashion among the Romanians, but it's still used uh, in diplomatic circles, I would say. And if you take a close look, uh, when he kisses her hand, he also uh, looks straight into her eyes. This direct eye contact is again an indicator of sincerity. 
So I would say that as far as happiness is concerned, uh, Klaus Johannes has got a plus minus, Mr. Fong got a minus. As far as color symbolism is concerned, you know that not only in Romania but also in the United States, um, uh, party members identify with the colors of their party. And the two candidates in the Romanian debates made extensive use of this uh, color symbolism. So the socialists uh, use the red color, yeah, whereas the liberals the blue color, uh, even in their adornment. So they use dyes of the colors of their own parties. Um, I would say that except for a red tie, any other red uh, piece of clothing on Victor Ponta would have looked ridiculous. So he asked the ladies in his family, uh, his wife, his daughter and his mother, to carry the color for him. Uh, and due to the fact that he made extensive use of the red color, in the mind of the people my age, 50 plus, yeah, this color was associated with the communist regime. And I think that this was one of the reasons why the balance of the elections was tilted in favor of Klaus Johannes. Uh, very many people uh, associated Ponta with our former president, uh, Charles Chesco. Yeah? And even worse, they compared him to the president or the leader of the North of North Korea, namely Kim Jong un who you know is the devil. Our next quote um, focuses on the facial expressions and according to Lanzetta and his collaborators, uh, facial expressions express emotions and these emotions are transferred to the viewers, influencing their attitude or their um, opinion concerning the debate, uh, sorry, the debaters or the, 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 the people that uh, were invited to the plateau. Now, on the whole, what we could say about the two candidates is that they made use of rigid or rather neutral facial expressions, at least at the beginning of the two debates. So, you see that you cannot guess uh, much from their facial expressions. Uh, some people said that Johannes looked very calm, very relaxed, just like any German, yeah, calculated, whereas Ponta showed wisdom. But, as the debates progressed, yeah, so did their facial expressions, and there was a moment when it was not exactly wisdom that the facial expression of Victor Ponta expressed. As you can see here, yeah, where we have an expression of surprise on um, the incumbent president's face. Uh, when did he produce this kind of expression? Uh, it was in the 20th minute of the first debate, when uh, he was talking, um, and when Klaus Johannes hardly had any chance to say anything. And all of a sudden, Johannes uh, stopped Ponta and asked the moderator about the pattern of the debate. Uh, Ponta was very surprised because he was interrupted. Yeah? And as you can see, the surprise uh, facial expression is uh, indicated, first of all, by the raised eyebrows. Uh, to be blamed for this, yeah, he 
somehow counterattack the honeys by producing this sarcastic uh, facial expression. So the key elements of this expression are the lips that are tight, uh, that are tight or pressed together. Only that the left hand corner is a little, uh, a little raised. Yeah. So we have here an asymmetrical smile. Uh, also, the eyelids are uh, tightly closed, and this is associated with anger or with aggression. So it's a sign of non-verbal aggression. So Ponta somehow looks as if he was uh, trying to focus on what Johannes said and trying to kill him for having accused him of um, uh, blocking the vote in the diaspora. You do not have to assume that Johannes was the angel and Ponta was the devil because he also reacted sarcastically. Um, in the second debate, um, Johannes came with a photo in which there were some members of the party Victor Ponta belonged to. And all these members were accused of um, various crimes, petty things. Um, Ponta, on the other hand, also brought with him a photo, most probably taken on the same day, same occasion, with one member of the party that Johannes belonged to, also accused of certain crime. So there is a dialogue going on between the two of them, and at the end of the dialogue, both of them adopted this kind of canine snarl, yeah? indicating that none of them wanted to look inferior to the other. So the dialogue was, um, I can leave this photo with you, this is what Johannes said, at which Papa said, Oh, I can also leave all this photo with you. Take photos with you, take whichever you want. Yeah, you should not take only the one you want, take all of them. Um, now, if we move to uh, oculesis, the use of uh, the eyesight, of the looks, um, you will see that very often uh, the gaze gives away our feelings or our thoughts. Um, now, again, as far as Johannes is concerned, we can say that he had the upper hand in what uh, the use of eye contact is concerned, in that whenever he talked to the people, whenever he addressed to the, to the viewers, to the audience at home, he turned from the moderator or from Victor Ponta and he looked directly into the camera, yeah? which showed that he treated the audience as friends, as, as equal people. Um, here you have uh, an image uh, illustrating this. Uh, one of the moderators asked, what does the Romanian of Klaus Johannes look like? Yeah? And when the moderator of uh, Madalina Pushnalo asked this question, oh, Johannes was looking at her, and then when he answered the question, he did not look at her, but he looked at the people at home. So in this way, he showed the Romanians that he was uh, treating, them and treating, treating them as equals and that um, he was closer to them than to the people in the plateau. Uh, the same uh, happened uh, in the second debate when um, at a certain moment the moderator, uh, sorry, no, uh, Johannes accused Ponta that he presented only statistics and figures to the viewers and that uh, people were fed up with statistics and that they wanted solutions. And then he asked the question to the people at home, do you think that um, the Romanians, you the Romanians, are better off since Ponta has become your prime minister? So again, he looks at the viewers. Uh, the direct case is combined with this finger pointing gesture, which is assumed in uh, the field of normal communication to be quite rude. But if you associate this with a direct eye gaze, I would say that this is not exactly an aggressive gesture, but rather a milder one in which he points to the people. Yeah? Um, now, when you cut a gaze with your interlocutor, this means that you are either uh, fed up with what he says, you are not interested in what he says, or you simply disregard him. And this is what Johannes did for the whole second debate. He did not even look at Victor Ponta. He looked sideways. Uh, this made Ponta angry to the point that uh, he begged Johannes to look at him at a certain point. Yeah? Uh, so you see that.
that he does not uh, keep eye contact with Ponta. Ponta, on the other hand, was on the watch out for all mistakes, all non-verbal all non mistakes that uh, Klaus Johannes performed during these debates. Uh, so, here, when Johannes asked him two very embarrassing questions, Ponta cut the gates. Uh, how did he do that? In the first case, he started blinking fast and nodding his head, yeah? Trying to eliminate Johannes from his uh, field of uh, the, the side. Uh, in the second picture, uh, Johannes asked him a question that maybe Ponta did not expect, namely, why he lied when he said that Johannes was going to cut off the retirement pensions. And this coming as a blow for Ponta, he completely stopped any eye contact between him and, um, and Johannes. Uh, this was uh, reflected by his lowered head, yeah, which was lowered for longer than usual, and also by the fact that he kept his eyes closed. This is a more delicate way of uh, disregarding your interlocutor than simply covering your uh, eyes with your palm, just like the children do. How much time have I got left? Five minutes? Okay. I don't know which slides I still have. Okay, um, I will come to, to the end in a second, um, saying something about body posture. Um, this is a photo from the second debate. Uh, you see that the candidates are seated, so they cannot make much use of the non-verbal behavior. They have to adapt to the environment. But what we can see is that Victor Ponta adopts the so-called closed position, in that his knees are next to the other, yeah? his feet are next to the other, and moreover, the hands are placed one over the other. This is a very defensive position. And it shows that the person is not that confident. On the other hand, uh, Klaus Johann seems very relaxed. Uh, he adopts what we call a local position, and moreover, this is an asymmetrical position as well. One leg is placed in front of the other, knees are wide apart, uh, he drinks water. In some of the photos, he is um, shown leaning on one hand on the table. Yeah? So, he adopts a dominant position. Uh, and coming to this uh, use of space, uh, Peter Collett, a famous um, specialist in the field of normal communication, said that relaxation is the key part of any dominance display because it suggests that the individual is concerned about being attacked and could easily respond if necessary. Relaxation is signaled by postural and movement cues. Postural cues consist of low muscle tone and absence of tension and asymmetric arrangements of the arms and legs, while movement cues consist of less movement and slower movement of the body. Submissive individuals, just like Victor Ponta, display the opposite behavior. They tend to adopt more symmetrical poses, to rearrange their arms and legs more often, to show more tension in their posture, and to move their body quickly and more often. And this is what Mr. Ponta did. If he was not reading the Bible, he was shuffling through his uh, papers, or looking for some more information in his briefcase, or taking notes of what uh, Klaus Johannes has said. And this brings us to the conclusions. Uh, so Ponta was more animated and more energetic. His normal behavior conveyed too many messages, some of which were not necessarily uh, uh, working of uh, trust, so they did not inspire any credibility. Johannes, on the other hand, was more controlled and at times quite rigid. Uh, and you might have expected this rigid behavior to work against him, but it was exactly this kind of behavior that tilted the balance in favor of Klaus Johannes. Um, okay, so I have mentioned all these things, so I will just uh, come to my two research questions and provide answers to them. Uh, the first one, if you remember, was what does the media, uh, media's visual presentation of a candidate reveal about Ponta and Klaus Johannes in the presidential campaign? I would say that the media tried to exploit uh, their weaknesses rather than their qualities. Uh, and on the whole, both of them proved
proved quite inexperienced and um, in the use of their novel behavior. And in order to be more successful in their next campaign, they need to be given some training in how to behave non-verbally. Uh, as far as the second research question is concerned, which of the novel dimensions was the one that uh, tilted the balance? I would say that uh, it was body posture yeah, and the facial expressions. And my last um, idea is that politics isn't just about principles. Crucially, it's about employing a novel behavior that is convincing and presidential. Thank you very much.
different contexts. I'm actually a linguist, specialized in Romance languages, and my talk will be on one linguistic element, um, which is used in communication, especially when information is reported. It encodes the fact that what is said by the speaker is not his or her own knowledge, so I didn't say it, yeah, but second-hand knowledge, so somebody else did. It is typical of uh, spoken conversation, of course. This uh, linguistic element of the discussion is present in a, as a type in several Romance languages and varieties, and it is derived uh, from the canonical verb to say, but now it is used mainly as an evidential marker, um, or, um, and I will mainly focus on Romanian, but uh, at the beginning I will start with a pan-Romance uh, perspective. So first I introduce uh, the protagonist of this talk, um, which you see in these examples from Spanish, Sardinian, Sicilian, uh, Romanian and Croatian. So you have examples like this, 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 so yes, yes, people say we're progressing, they say. It's Latin American Spanish, yeah, it's not an Iberian Spanish. Then in Sardinian you have things like in Custo Castellona, Pistaya, Pizzo, Sure. So in this class in the song, the thing was said to live, was said to live. Uh, in Sicilian, in Chicago, Viva Mochino, Figurana, it is reported that they had finished their money. Or in Romanian, Amochica, Yavadata, Trotsar, and Fai, Karabia, Trotsar, so uh, once upon a time, they say, it was said, yeah, there was a king who had three dog daughters. It's a uh, common kind of fairy taste. Uh, even in Galician, you have a similar example, and um, this element in bold face here is the uh, one I'm interested in, and uh, you find uh, similar elements in many languages, um, but uh, I will, uh, at the beginning, uh, concentrate on Romance. So, this uh, element uh, is translated by things like people say, they say, it was said, it is reported, allegedly, reportedly. And it, in all languages at issue here, it is derived from a third person, a singular present form of the word to say, uh, and the uh, subordinator, the conjunction, uh, a complementizer that. Yeah? So, I will gloss it as says that, and uh, um, my talk will be uh, called, and of course, this says that element is not a full word uh, anymore. It developed into a marker of evidentiality. It's an adverb now. My talk will be structured as follows. Uh, first of this short introduction, I will say something about, about the grammatical notion of uh, evidentiality and uh, the role of hearsay plays in evidential systems. In section 3, I will sketch an overview on the grammaticalization of this hearsay marker in Romanian. And uh, in section 4, I will offer short semantic and syntactic analysis uh, of this uh, element, and uh, I will illustrate it by just by examples uh, from Romanian, uh, where the marker is Chica. Chica. Um, at the end, there's a short conclusion, some of the results, and uh, even shorter outlook. So the specific talk of my, um, the specific aim of my talk is just to show that there's a, a, an evidential marker that cross-linguistically follows a, a certain pattern, a certain uh, word formation pattern. Um, this evidential marker is more or less grammaticalized, so it's a fixed form, it's uh, an adverb now. Um, the current syntax and meaning of this evidential marker can be derived by an internal path of development. This I will, uh, will be shown in, in my presentation. And uh, I will start from a pan romance perspective, but then I will focus on the Romanian evidential marker Chica. So, what uh, does uh, we say and evidentiality mean? So, in the languages of the world, Hearsay can be expressed by several uh, grammatical and lexical means, and you have some of the uh, examples in, in, in 6 to 9, where, for example, uh, in, uh, in English, uh, in uh, example 6, you have something like uh, allegedly, where the reportative adverb, the suspect was allegedly involved in the robbery, um, tells uh, or uh, shows that the speaker marks his, uh, the content of his uh, uh, assertion as third-hand information. Somebody else said it. In Germany, you have motor verbs like sollen, yeah, where it's clear that uh, uh, the source of information is not, uh, not 
uh, confirmed by the speaker, but it, uh, it's somebody else. And you have, uh, um, in French, you have uh, an example here like uh, Jean, uh, Jean Letron, très grand Letron, uh, where you have a personal parenthetical clause, um, where you have Letron, which uh, points uh, again third uh, knowledge, uh, third hand knowledge, and it's a personal form. And then you have examples like uh, in Nine from Romanian again, um, where you have Sicia Luna, Kada, Fi, Ajute, Shi, Kukan, where you have the special particular form of the Romanian not uh, presumptive, the presumptive, yeah, which also uh, uh, marks third hand knowledge. You have also full work here, Sicia Luna, Sicia Luna, so the word said that, but. Uh, well, people said that, um, but uh, in combination with the presumptive, you get this, this special evidential meaning. Um, okay, so the term evidentiality in uh, linguistics in grammar was introduced by uh, uh, Roman Jakobson in 1957, and it was indeed meant to indicate a verbal category. That is, uh, uh, it was. Uh, meant to indicate a verbal inflection which is found in, in several languages uh, in the world, not, mostly not in European languages. Uh, the current definitions uh, of evidentiality are given here. The most famous one is the one by Eichenwald, which, uh, uh, which says that evidentiality is a linguistic category whose primary meaning is a source of information. So evidentially, uh, evidentiality is a source of information and some of the other uh, uh, definitions you fit here, find here by Anderson, and then they say that's not only the source, but also the kind of the source of information. Um, this the source of information can be visual, it can be uh, reported, and it can be also um, derived by inference, and we will see this later. So in some languages uh, in the world, like for example in Quechua, we have a particular evidential marking attached as a verbal inflection to the verbs um, is an inflection suffix which uh, conveys this evidential meaning. So you have a suffix like me or n, yeah, which uh, uh, calls direct uh, or own visual uh, experience, a c or s, something like that, uh, which marks the proposition as reported, and a cha, uh, which uh, uh, because the uh, derived knowledge is uh, inferential uh, knowledge, which, which is already very close to epistemic uh, modality. Um, so, for example, in uh, Quechua, you have these examples. I, hope, I don't think you can read them very really well, but they, all these examples encode the same proposition, saying that Ines visited her sister yesterday, but in uh, 10 A, the N uh, encodes the uh, the, the proposition as uh, direct, uh, direct experience, yeah, so the speaker has seen this fact. Yeah? In uh, 10b, the s uh, marks it that as reported, so the speaker has heard, heard about the fact that he has visited her sister yesterday, and in 10c, the chunk uh, is uh, inferential evidence. He, he may, may have seen uh, that uh, the car was not there, so, so, so he is probably. Um, was, was away and, and uh, had visited her sister. Um, these are already uh, the three main types uh, of evidentiality, which can be grammatically encoded in several languages of the world, namely the direct evidence, visual knowledge, the indirect evidence, reported hearsay knowledge, and inferential evidence. And it's of course uh, the indirect evidence, uh, the reported hearsay evidence, which is uh, an issue when we come to our um, evidential mark assessment to the Chica marker. Um, this uh, reported hearsay second hand knowledge marker has been um, uh, subdivided in, in further categories by, by, by Palmer, for example, as reported uh, from, from, from a from a, from a speaker uh, who, whom the speaker himself knows um, by uh, in another um, category which means that there is an arbitrary source of this knowledge and uh, the, the last uh, possibility is that there is a generic, general knowledge behind uh, the thing. Um, also, Willett has uh, divided this, this uh, hearsay um, evidentiality uh, in uh, 
uh, in third, uh, in, in second person, in a, in, in, in a let's say, in a uh, knowledge recorded by conversation with a second person, by thirds or generic sources, or uh, even uh, uh, there's an old uh, category folklore introduced by Willem. So in folklore, it's very common to have these Chica markers, even in Sardinia, this Nafi, uh, in fairy tales, in oral, oral, uh, oral uh, um, narration. You find it uh, very, very often in, 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 in these kinds of uh, folklore tales. Okay, so um, all these kinds of uh, uh, evidentiality, all these subtypes of reportative evidentiality, um, can be marked by these cess dead markers in the Romance languages and issues. So you have here a table uh, from a paper by Silvio Pustina and, and me, uh, published a couple of years ago. And we have uh, shown that there is some variation in between the Romance languages. So, for example, uh, you can have a, a, this disaster marker, you can have it as a direct, direct speech marker, as a quotative marker. I am not sure if this is uh, possible in Romanian. So it's, Read and remain, you can use Chica to introduce direct speech. Yeah, it's more like, a, like an evidential marker for, for indirect uh, speech. Um, in this talk, I will uh, be uh, mainly interested in the semantics and syntax of Sest in Romanian, and from now on, I will leave aside the other languages. Yeah? So I will concentrate uh, on Romanian. So we are already in uh, the third section, the grammaticalization of. Uh, Chica. And uh, now let's have a closer look at all the four linguistic levels relevant for grammaticalization that is phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics. So, in uh, the examples here, now we still have uh, examples from, from all the Romance languages here that I will just uh, read out and spell out the, the examples from Romanian to you. So, we can say that uh, in um, uh, that, uh, as far as uh, phonology is concerned, that the verbal part of the zestus element cannot be, um, it, it's, it's not uh, dividable anymore. It is one single unit, unit is this chica, but it comes from something like the sicica or so, or sicica. So it was the third person singular plus ka, and now it's chica. And that's the case for all the other languages. So it is always uh, uh, originally a third person singular. Um, the examples in 12 now show that uh, you can cannot inflect this verbal form anymore. So you have chica, but you cannot have sicica or sicica or sicica or sicica. It's uh, invariable. It's chica and that's it. So no possibility to, to inflect it. Um, as for syntactic properties, it can be shown. Um, as in this uh, example given here, that the hearsay marker nowadays can also be used in other contexts than in its uh, original uh, inflected form verb plus complementizer. So in many Romans languages you can even have it as an answer, like in Sardinian or even in Galician, not in Romanian. You cannot uh, uh, answer questions like uh, No, chica da or chica no. <laughs> But this is possible in the other, uh, other languages, even uh, in Sicilian, you can just answer Dichica. Yeah? So people say, say that, so it might be true. Um, furthermore, you can also see cases like that, then, that in, uh, uh, in the languages of issue, um, the, the ka element reappears. You have things like, so you have a tripling of cas, but uh, that shows us that the chica, the, 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 the um, conjunction in chica is not transparent anymore, so you can repeat it. Yeah? It's a bit cacophonic, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't say that. Okay, um, furthermore, you can also see that uh, very often this, uh, this chica is doubled with again another full verb form of uh, the verb to say. So you have sio se conosce de diminianza chica, asha se siche. So it's a kind of doubling, but it's not a real doubling, because only one form is the full verb form of to say. 
Um, so, uh, on all these levels, homology, morphology, syntax, semantics, it uh, can be said that, that um, um, this element chica is phonologically eroded. It has uh, morphologically been decategorized. It doesn't inflect anymore. It is syntactically realized as an adverb, and it doesn't have the semantics of a lexical verb anymore. And all these uh, criteria are considered typical indicators for grammaticalization processes um, by many researchers, for example, also by, by Heinen. Um, from another perspective, one would also claim that the development of chica is a process of univerbation of two elements, where the result is an adverb, that is adverbialization, which is a particular form of lexicalization, and that the whole process is not uh, a process of uh, grammaticalization, but something like uh, a pragmaticalization, and that uh, chica is not a functional grammatical element, but it's a functional element on the discourse level, so it's uh, a process, process of discursivization. So it's a discourse marker. Um, okay. Um, I'm not uh, sure how many time we have. Um, I'm still in time. Okay, so then I go to the next section. Um, now, uh, section four. And I come to the uh, analysis and I take the table from uh, from the beginning. So the, the, I come to the Romanian part and now I have more examples from Romanian. Yeah? You have examples like the following um, in 26. It's interesting because uh, in this example, Sakautam Cevali Lucro, Caporta, Aus, Chica, Catea. So let's look for something uh, so for work because the baby listen, listen, uh, it says, Maybe it balances, I don't know. Um, I haven't eaten since yesterday, so this chica, uh, there could be a, over, a visible subject, maybe Urta, no? the belly speaking, maybe, maybe not. It's a, kind of, it's, it's, it's a bit ambiguous, this example. Um, what is clear that in 26, chica clearly marks second hand evidence, as it does in the next example, in 27, where we have Moshkopa, Kinskuna, Devagili, Chica, Sarabs, Chi, Ya, Sarabs, so. Uh, Chica, uh, maybe probably he says that you have got to be patient and to be patient again. Yeah? Um, so these are the biggest cases um, where it's not really clear if Chica can also mark something like direct speech. It seems to be uh, uh, allowed to mark an indirect speech here. Uh, in 28 you see a very interesting effect because uh, if uh, we have uh, um, wait a minute, if, uh, yeah, here in Chica Yoni Bonaf, Chica is a, is a, a, a real um, evidential marker, and in Chica Bandona Luce Felicilia we have this kind of uh, traditional oral generic folklore norm knowledge. Yeah, it's the same, Chica, people say Bandona Luce Felicilia. So that would be the third category called folklore by, by, by Willet. And the interesting effect is here in example 30, I don't think you see it. Um, it's like El uh, Cicica Chica Lograt Mod versus Chica El Cicica Lograt Mod. And you can see that when Chica is at the beginning, it has the whole <coughs> sentence under its, its scope. And when, when it's uh, in the embedded clause, El Cicica Chica Lograt Mod, it uh, somehow repeats. Uh, the, 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 the second hand knowledge but it refers to the subject of the of the main clause. Um, as for the preferred position of uh, Chica, um, oh no, here we have a, again a very interesting minimal pair of Yon Chica from Yasa, which makes it really clear that here we have uh, one clause where Yon is set to, to smoke, so Yon smokes allegedly versus Jan Sitschika from Yasa, John Jan says that he himself smokes. So we have a minimal pair which illustrates the fact that Sitschika, uh, he is a full work and he cannot be a full work anymore. Yeah? So one clause and here we have two clauses. Um, as for the preferred, preferred um, syntactic position, Chika is very often centered in this, sentence initially and very often after the, the subject. 
but it can also appear in all other positions where usually parentheticals can appear, so you can have chica individual for splints, individual chica for splints. You cannot have individual a chica for splints because here you have the Romanian uh, auxiliary TLT cluster where you cannot insert anything, so that's, uh, that's normal, but then you can have chica at the end of the clause uh, between uh, the, the uh, auxiliary and the participle. These are all uh, positions which also would allow parenthetical insertions in, in normal uh, uh, speech. Um, so I think that this parenthetical position is the origin for Chica. So you could start with a sentence like this, Anasi Chica Yon from Yasa, where we have, uh, say, it was a complement clause. Um, if you remove the subject and make the whole thing impersonal, then you have a personal verb of say with a complement clause here, yeah? so that would be the first step. And if you then move the subject to the first position and uh, say something like young from Mersa, yeah, you have the first step versus a uh, 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 parenthetic position, something like Sisichik Young Sisichik of Mersa. You couldn't have a Sisichik in the final position. This is uh, only possible uh, when you have chica uh, fully grammaticalized as an adverb that which then can appear in every uh, parenthetical position possible, possible, uh, possible for Romania. So what I want to show by that, that is it is a, the parenthetical position which is at the origin of the grammaticalization of elements like chica or chica in Sicilian or Latin Sardinian or Dishka in Galician. And you have similar things uh, even in other languages like in Macedonian and in, in Greek and uh, non romance languages. Um, so we had, at the beginning, we have a, a biclausal structure. So we have two clauses a lexical verb of saying and a complementizer. And via the, the, um, the, the removement of the first subject, and uh, the topicalization of the second subject to the left periphery and a stepwise loss of the specific or personal uh, referentiality of the first subject, the possibility to interpret the same plus complementizer as a parenthetical uh, goes hand in hand with its morphosyntactic fusion to chica. Yeah? And at the end, you have just a monoclosal structure and the says. That element is an evidential marker or an adverb. Yeah? And it's the parenthetical positions uh, evolved in, in, in a spoken conversation, which is the clue to the grammaticalization uh, uh, of Chica. So I will skip to the conclusions, I think. It's time to go to include conclusions. And yeah, here we are. So I uh, wanted to show you. Uh, that elements like uh, evidential or sometimes also quotative markers like says and chica in Romanian um, are present in many Romance languages and varieties. They are also present in non Romance languages and varieties. Um, its origin, the origin of chica is the third person singular of the uh, of a verb of the form of a verb of saying plus complementizer and it is more or less grammaticalized. Um, the syntax and uh, semantic semantics uh, of the development of the hearsay marker was illustrated by the example of, of Romanian Chica. And I have a very short outlook for you. Um, there are more elements like that. It's not only Chica. You know it from Romanian probably. We have things like uh, Chica, Parca, Kretka, yeah? and in regional Romanian, yeah? uh, various forms of Pisilica, Pisernikaya, or Matinka, Matemka, which is very, very, let's say, dialectal or dialectal. And colloquial, of course, yeah. And these markers are similar, like chica, that they, they, they impart, encode uh, similar meanings. It's always a kind of evidential meaning. And they are different from the use of other verbs, like fierisch or probabil or the sigur, where you can have fierisch de kar, ale treptate, probabil kar, ale treptate, but you will never be able to have Fearless the car of Robotica uh, in all these parenthetical positions, which is possible with the Pisinica, Matinka, Chica, Parka, So that's it. Thank you for your attention.
Anumite Pajor Communication. She was the first director of the University of Mosca in Copper Slovenia. She held several important positions, including that of the Minister of Education, Science and Sport in Slovenian government. As the minister, she has contributed to the establishment of higher education institutions in the Slovenian region of Mosca. She collaborated in European commissions, uh, in, uh, in particular in the European Commission high respect panels that have formed ministry policies and strategies for higher education and research. She has facilitated the preparation of the formal basis for Slovenia's integration into the European research area. She was the president of the last school with master in Slavic panel, uh, European Commission, Director of General for Education and Budget. Her work focuses on the formation of models of equal education in areas of linguistic, linguistics and cultural content and of didactism in the cultural communication. She has received the high award from the President of the Republic of France, Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, for the promotion of the French language and culture and the strategies for the encouragement of linguistic diversity. She was awarded also, from the President of the Republic of Italy, Cavaliere della Repubblica Italia, she has taken part to the evaluations of the university within European Universities Association, including Henry Gordon Force Academy. In 2013, the University of Mosca nominated her Professor Emeritus. There is a gentleman, Professor Emeritus Luciaccio. Spoken, I hope, too. The other 
science, civil society and economy, preservation and transmission of values, and so on and so on. This new European civilization model will be confronted with the first test just in these numerous contact areas, where conditions for a coexistence and mechanisms to protect cultural sensitivities of different groups, as well as ethnic and language groups, will stimulate social cohesion. That's why I put the citation of Welsh lifestyles are no longer limited or delineated by nationally based cultures, categories, boundaries, and concrete distinctions such as foreign and familiar are becoming increasingly inaccurate, largely as the result of globalization of economic and communication systems. Social and political contexts require a new management procedure. The European strategy for cross-cultural and plurilingual education must be retaught and presented for debate. Abolition of different kinds of culture will demand a major revision of traditional and ethnocentric conception and social behaviors that we know in Europe. National languages, hegemony of one language, you have here some lingua franca before English, the global status of English is a result of its role in the economic context and of the implications for social mobility. The various institutions of society require a means of common communication, understood as a shared understanding of common goal that does not require reflection and consideration on its application, and it is seen as a manifestation of common interest. That's why we are all speaking in English in Romania today, at this occasion. Let us think about what it means multilingualism and what it means plurilingualism. The plurilingualism is, of course, on affection, cognitive and strategic ability, awareness about languages and their usage, multilayered ability to integrate and communicate multilingual and cross-cultural environment. Multilingualism is a feature of nations, groups, areas. Multilingual and cross-cultural environment connected with the recognition, acceptance, and comprehension of its cultural context in which languages are realized. Maybe you know what's common European framework for languages. It's a framework that can unify the awareness and the assessment of languages in the European Union. That means that we have levels and descriptors for everybody that would like to know what is the level of his knowledge and skills and competence of one language. And in this work is written about plurilingualism and pluriculturalism. That is a personal feature which is put into action in the common participation. It is not a new competence, as well we all use different registers in our life, in the same language, in different situations, just as we use different cultural repertoires in different situations. The new idea is the development of plurilingualism and pluriculturalism as a result of the process of studying and learning the languages. But surely we have we are embarrassed about third culture. You have now language awareness, multiculturalism, pluriculturality, cross-culturality, and transculturalism. Language awareness, you know what it is. It is knowing about the system, about the use and the structure of language in one person. Multiculturalism is a way of this. Said and pluriculturality have a way to explain. What is the difference between cross-culturality and transculturality? It's transculturality, for instance, is the state where culture and language form an entity that is inseparable in these cases. Cross-culturality 
The content and the form of individual response in this result is the result of a composed, dynamic, and changeable process of awareness formation at a given moment. And here I will just repeat what Agar says, the first of, of those that invented the, the word lingua culture, if you will find Risa there or, or other, their, their combination is culture and language, lingua culture. When you, we run into different meanings when you become, become aware of your own and work to build a bridge to the others. Culture is what you are up to. Language fills the spaces between us with sounds, but culture forges the human connection to them. Culture is in language and language is loaded with culture. <coughs> another, another terminology that is more maybe, maybe less used is a culture of memory. I have studied coal as I found in the best of things. Domain. Use of medicinal means in higher mental functions related to cultural behavior and practices, for instance, perception and active use of intercultural language communication, formation of active and empathic relation and position between participants participants when we done with another in communicative situation, use of safeguards and incentives to the participation in communication, all of these can develop the cultural memory. Cole says that cultural memory is developed through the elaboration of more complex tools of memory that help create a new, deeper cultural experience, which serves as a basis for further development of between individuals and groups. And now let us ask ourselves how to obtain 3C. The abbreviation 3C means cross cultural competence. 3C. You know, Oscar is an only one, the first one. Then you have Mark Byron and Morgan or Byron alone that developed intercultural uh, communication, intercultural education within the classroom. Egan spoke about general education by phases of our age. Bennett did few models of development of intercultural sensitivity. Kremsch, Kremsch, the last one, is working, still working, Claire Kremsch is still working on intercultural communication in the virtual life. I will say a few words on the model that we did at our university. What we did was that we integrate elements of three areas, cognitive, emotional, and dynamic. The cognitive area refers to individuals' thought, concepts, judgment, and assessment activities. The emotional area refers to emotions and values that the individual assign to his or her nation and national attributes. And the dynamic area, aspirations to actively participate in the dynamic of happenings related to the nationality, to the nationalities. We had three levels of competence. The first one was, was at the level of attitudes to intercultural diversity. The second level was discovery of intercultural diversity and modulation of influence. And the third one, the highest one, was how to transfer the intercultural awareness to life. And we did descriptors for all these three levels. But let us go back to Kremsch. The choice of languages and variety of particular language used by the individual at a given moment is not only influenced by the individual's will or need, but also by social network of his peers and supporters, as well as his current interest and general social sensitivity towards the community. In language 
knowledge learning, and then we choose the problem. Computer has become more than just a technical end. Internet creates a continuum between the real and the virtual world. Since in this network, the individual is moving outside of his or her national environment, the mutual influences of real communication put his or her national and cultural identity to a test. We did a very good research among youngs, youngs of how they feel the identity, the national identity across cultural identity. It was really curious to see that. So what Kremsch found out is that the, 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 the use of computer has enabled creation of a communication space where creativity and play are boundless. The mythical reality that we are surround us French said, boundaries between different languages do exist. They are connected between cultures, between memory and historical experience, between actual events and virtual scenarios. The capability of individuals to engage in the real world is not developed in a boundless space, but in the ability to decide which the limits that can be exceeded are. Just a few words of how, how, what's really knowledge of multiple queries and the cultural awareness and sensitivity. Cross-cultural competence is recognized as a critical capability that helps personal become mission ready. Yes. 
actually open areas among the various sciences that we examine the three C. Introductionary in the part of introduction, uh, there is a collection of how to define the cross-cultural competence in the mass of variety of definitions. The second part is description of individual levels of proficiency or competency in performing a specific task focused on psychomotor and behavioral competences. The third part of the collection uh, speaks about abilities and to empower or limit the cross-cultural awareness. And uh, finally, how to assess to receive. The presented works are also focused on questions when and how to assess achievements or verification and how they should be used and on what purposes. Self-report assessment of TC may actively reflect an individual level of self-efficiency about his or, his or her success in cross-cultural context rather than true level of 3C of actual performance. The assessment of 3C by models that apply to other areas in the cases of cross-cultural awareness in the army is only partially suitable or even a nuisance at all. The real world in which military personnel operate is not an experimental laboratory where scientists can control condition and test the utility of the spider competence. The solution in this case could be two and part in two directions, verifying skills and abilities that support the rising of TC and crossing the interviews of the service personnel with the data of lessons and, and uh, reports and reviews of disability written reports. But it's very important to analyze all experiences, positive and negative one. Experience and negative effect of traumatic events will impact the army personnel to see on future you can just know about some movies that we have seen on Afghanistan, before on Vietnam, and so on. Studying new possibilities to resolve this stressful situation should be further explored. The research in this direction should not remain within individual science and geographical importance. One of this, of this study that I mentioned before, cross-cultural competence in the army leaders, are prominent spatial threats called the Big Five. What are these Big Five? These Big Five are openness, conscientiousness, extraversion, agreeableness, and emotional stability. These threats were empirically derived using a variety of methods and represent a comprehensive approach to personal structure, measuring on the vertical axis the extent from dominance to submission and on the horizontal axis extent from both hostility to warm friendliness. The authors describe the authors describe the three C as a set of cultural multi-layer ability and behaviors and attitudes integrated into practice patterns of a system that enables army corps to work effectively in cross-cultural situations. The current meaning of 3C among professionals where power and weapons were significant in the century ago. It is by studying and applicability of different models and strategies for successful cross-cultural mediation in exceeding conflict 
And finally, by stimulating the most appropriate generation and direct conducts that could minimize human and material losses. Is the 3C the new method that will more successfully chase off terrorism and just wars? Let's end with a quote that tries to answer to this question. Cultural knowledge and linguistic ability are some of the best weapons in the struggle against terrorism. Master, mastering these weapons can mean the difference between victory and defeat on the battlefields. It was my pleasure just to present a few thoughts, beliefs, and my research issue at this conference. And let me at the end congratulate with the organizers for this really interesting conference. But as I can put myself under the head of the evaluators of the European University Association that we did at this academy for the results of this evaluation and for the recommendations that I know they will consider and go further to the success. Thank you very much.
You see, once we have seen Berlusconi falling when Obama was waiting for him. So we can wait at that time to meet his from the floor.